Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him. Well, how many of you recognize that as a hymn? Yes, you did. That means you're kind of older, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, we are older, right? Yeah, I guarantee you it's amazing uh, how God blesses us and how God uses us and what God says to us. I, uh, <clears throat> for, for most of our people, and, and if you haven't been here long enough to have been through some of the seminars that I occasionally do on the family and home and relationships, one of them is called Not Wrong, Just Different. And um, it, it, yeah, right. And it is, uh, <laughs> it is kind of the backbone of a lot of things. And uh, what it deals with is the fact that as men and women, uh, we, are, we have different qualities, traits, and um, so forth. And uh, they're not wrong, they're just different. And they are different. And one of the areas that uh, I describe is an area of communication. And in the area of communication, it, it, we often get in trouble with this because we don't realize that we don't speak the same language. Because we're both speaking English and we think that, okay, that means what it means in English and that we're all on the same page. But, yeah, but in, in many times that's not exactly true because men often speak in order to state facts. Um, you, that's why men seemingly get along as good as they do or well as they do at work, at, for, as an example. Uh, you can put 25 men working together in the same room, and they can work together forever in the same room. I mean, they may not like each other, don't get me wrong, but, uh, but, but, they, but there's not a problem there, and they can work forever uh, with 25 guys because when they speak to each other, they just pretty much speak to just share information. And the other guys receive it as information and go on, and life's grand. However, with the ladies, this is not necessarily so. Uh, I don't know how many of you, and I'm not trying to start anything, all right? So just, just hang on. Uh, but I'm not sure how many of you have worked with a, with a group of ladies before. But if you have, uh, God bless you uh, is all I can. Because, man, I'm telling you, ladies can be tough on each other especially. And one of the reasons why is because uh, women often speak in order to convey feelings. Men speak in order to convey truth. Women often speak, not always, but often speak in order to convey feelings. So women read code. Uh, you get four or five women working in the same room or same office, and they're all talking to each other. And then, uh, oh, that's a beautiful dress, and oh, your hair looks so nice today. And, uh, fine, men uh, here, truth, hair, good, dress, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Women, uh, well, what's wrong with my dress? You don't think my hair looks nice today? I mean, you just read code into everything that is said, and then somebody's feelings get hurt, and then somebody else gets hurt, and somebody else says something, and before you know it, you've got a battle royal going. So on Father's Day, guys, I, I didn't really mean to start something with all that. Uh, you guys know I love women more than I do men, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. Thank God. Thank God. And uh, so I'm not trying, I'm not, ladies, I'm not trying to kill you or anything, but just to kind of convey on Father's Day, I think at least one thing, you know, now you see the message if you have the notes, you see the message, we're talking about not many fathers today, but before we get into that, I wanted to maybe share uh, about, about five words, guys, that you need to be cautious of with your wives. These are deadly words, uh, and they don't appear to be because they appear to be uh, words, when you hear them, if you're a man, you hear the word, and it's fine, and it's great, but uh, I want to I want to translate about five words for you real quick, okay? Would that be all right? You might want to write them down, because I know you use these, all, or you hear these all the time, and I just want you to know, you know, as the code goes out, I, you guys, you, you don't have uh, the equipment to be able to read code like ladies do, right? You know, women have basically like radar, you know, the scanning at all times and picking up clues. Uh, men, we don't have this radar. We, we have something akin to rabbit ears with tinfoil wrapped around it. And we, it just doesn't pick up these kind of signals, all right? So let me pick them up and translate them. The first, the first deadly word is the word fine. Fine. This is what a woman would say at the end of an argument when she knows she's right 
and she knows you wrong, and you just need to be quiet. Fine. All right, second word, nothing. Nothing means something, right? What's wrong with you? Nothing. That means something is definitely wrong, and you need to get a little bit worried about it. Third word is uh, go ahead. Don't do it. <laughs> this is not a word of permission. <laughs> this, is a, this is a word of challenge, and don't do it. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever means uh, it's her way of saying, well, just forget about you. you know? <laughs> Yeah, regardless, whatever. And then the last one is, um, uh, that's okay. That's okay is, uh, means she's thinking long and hard about how and when you are going to pay for whatever you just <laughs> did. It's okay. Yeah, that's right. Fine, nothing, go ahead, um, whatever, and that's okay. All right, be careful of those words. All right, let's get into what we're, what we're doing, all right? All right, just something for you there. Uh, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture from 1 Corinthians 4. This is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, and, and, and just to get us in the flow of thinking uh, about this, the Apostle Paul fathered many churches. Uh, he fathered many ministers. He was a mentor. He was a church builder. He was a, a church planter. I mean, the Apostle Paul is responsible for uh, really the evangelism and the movement of the ministry of God and Christ uh, through, through the continent of Asia, uh, just tremendous. And, and, and uh, many of the 17 books out of the New Testament books are written by the Apostle Paul. And so uh, there's much information, and Paul shares things with his churches just like a father would share with his family, with his sons or daughters or, or, or family. And so in one instance here in the church in Corinth, of course, the church at Corinth, if you knew a lot about it, you would know that it had all kinds of problems. It just did everything, almost almost everything you could name, it did, it did wrong. Well, they had this uh, brouhaha going on about some people that uh, had gotten all puffed up, is what the King James word is. They had gotten puffed up, which means they got full of arrogance and full of pride, is what it basically boils down to. And they were puffed up at some of the other members because they felt they had certain rights and privileges and blah, blah. And the Apostle Paul sends them this letter. And in chapter 4, it's a little instruction about this stuff that's going on. And, um, and he says, you know, I hope that the Lord will let me come one day and it will permit me to leave where and come and I'll be able to come to you in person. And, uh, but for right now, I'm going to send you this letter and I hope that this will straighten things out. But just know this, uh, that if it doesn't, uh, I'm sure the Lord's going to send me down there in person. And, and of course, uh, the ones that were puffed up, they just kind of stayed a little arrogant, a little nasty because they thought, well, he's not coming down here. So the Apostle Paul writes, and, and I'm going to, we're only going to read about four verses from it, but just so you can kind of get in the flow of a little bit of uh, father, father thinking. Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you don't, don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I've begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in the church. So the Apostle Paul is saying, you all might have 10,000 instructors in your life, 10,000 um, Bible teachers in your life, Sunday school teachers, uh, caregivers, nannies, mentors. You might have... 10,000 people that input into your life, but you're, but you're not going to have many fathers. And the implication there is that to be a father is more than to be a babysitter. That to be a father is more than just coming in and, and trying to take care of a, of a few little physical needs or a little, uh, a little emotional things or a few little instructions. That fatherhood is much broader than in just simple instruction and simple care and some learning or some training. As a matter of fact, 
Um, it's getting harder nowadays to get dads to be even babysitters in families, right? I mean, that would be a minor miracle in some families just to get dad to keep the kids every now and then. Because we seem to be, and I know this is not news to you, we seem to be in an epidemic of, of uh, well, just, we'll just call it uh, absentee dads. And they're absent for a lot of reasons. It's not always just them. It's not, it's not just the fact that we've come into an epidemic of dads not wanting to take care of their families, although that is true in many ways. But sometimes it's, uh, it, it's simply uh, he doesn't know he has a family or, uh, or he's, uh, he walked away from his family and, and, and he's no longer has any input in it whatsoever or maybe he's uh, in prison or jail or what, there's some, something that holds back or maybe he's at work a long way away. You know, a lot of times people have to work jobs and they have to go and travel and they're a long way away from home. But, but there just seems to be... Uh, 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 a dirge of absentee dads w with some hor pretty horrible com consequences of this. I listed on the bottom of your outline, if you picked up one of the outline, I just put about, oh, <laughs> what, 10 things down there. Just some statistics that come from uh, modern studies about uh, the effects on the family of not having a father has in, in life. And almost any of those statistics that you read are bad because fatherlessness is a terrible thing in the life of a child and in the life of a family. Now, why is this true that not having a father around has such devastating consequences? Now, you know, many families have mom there, and I'm not putting down on mom, and thank God for mom I mean, mom, mom's the emotional seat of the family. Mom keeps things together. We all love our mom. Mom does wonderful things, and if it weren't for mom, there wouldn't be any families in many cases. But why is it that, that even with mom there, the absence of dad really makes such a difference in the, in the movement of a family and in the flow of a, of a life of the children? Is there a reason for that? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, we have lots of instructors in our life. We have lots of people that input into our life. But, it, but, but the unique person in our life is our Father. That you can have a bunch of people involved in your life, but you, but you don't have many fathers. I want to say three things about children first, and then, and then I, want to, I want to talk to us about what our job is as a father. The, the first, first let, me, let me start with uh, Luke 1. In Luke 1, uh, this is uh, a passage that's talking about an elderly Levitical pastoral couple by the name of Zachariah and Elizabeth. Now, many of you that know uh, the story of Christmas and you know the story of Jesus, you know that um, Elizabeth is Mary's cousin uh, who births Christ and that before Gabriel came to Mary, she, he came to Elizabeth, and he said, you, even though you're old, you've been praying a long time, you're going to have a child, and, well, let's just read it. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. The thing I want you to notice there first of all, is that uh, before John was even born, the Holy Spirit had already named him and had already told his mom and dad what they were supposed to name him, which reminds you of a passage in the Old Testament, if you, if you read your Bible very much, or you've heard very much preaching about things like this, there's an Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And in the first chapter, the first four or five verses of the, of, the, of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah himself is saying, you know, before I was formed in the womb of my mother, God, God called me and ordained me to be a prophet to the nations. Now, what is that saying about children? Well, the first thing it says about children is that every child has a purpose. Now, this is critical to know, and, and I want you to, to know why it's critical, because in the world that we're facing today, there seems to be an all-out assault against children. Now, I know that many of you have been paying attention to what's been happening uh, lately, 
And by lately, I mean in, even in the last few months, in many states in our country. In, in many states in our country, there have been a new creation of laws, and these laws concern um, the killing of babies. Now, they call it abortion because it, they want it to sound nice, but the, the fact is, uh, the industry of abortion is built on the fact that there are unwanted children in this world. And that it's okay to take away unwanted children. Well, according to the Bible and according to what God says, there's no such thing as an unwanted child. Because every child that God creates has a purpose. And we need to help our children understand that they are a gift from God. And that we consider them a blessing in our family and they are God's gift to our life. Now to do this, verse 15, the apostle Paul said, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. This is talking about the baby John that's born. For he'll be great in the sight of the Lord and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, which seems to indicate to me that there's going to need to be some instruction necessary for John to become everything that he needs to be. Because according to this, uh, there are some things that John is to stay, uh, that he must stay away from some things and he must grab on to other things. He must stay away from wine and strong drink, and that's just an example. I mean, this is the Nazarite vow, and I don't want to get into all of that, but, but one of the, you know, you can't touch a dead person, you can't cut your hair, you can't get strong drink or, or uh, wine or str any other kind of strong drink. And, um, and so John had to be instructed about this. So children need to be instructed because it's just not natural for them to know the things that are important in life. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen that by osmosis or by birth, a child is going to know what they should and shouldn't do in life. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way in which he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. In other words, telling us that God has a way for every child to go in life. And that as parents, what our job is, and dad, especially with you as the leader of the family, our job is to know our children so well that we can help them understand how they're created by God, what their talents are, what their abilities are, and what would be good for them to move toward in life because we're to train them up to go in the way that they should go, not the way we should go, but the way they should go. And I see so many times parents living vicariously through their kids. I know you see this. They're trying to be, you know, they weren't athletes, but they, they pushed their child to be the greatest athletes in the world because they wanted to be an athlete. And now they're trying to live vicariously through some child and put so much pressure on these little fellas. You would think it was a major league. Kill the officials and everything else. It's unbelievable how much stress and force things can have. But the Bible says that we're to train them up. And, and the reason why is because children naturally follow the path of least resistance, don't they? Now, you guys that, are married, you guys that have been divorced and you have children and, and the children go from one to the other are perfectly aware of this, I know, because you watch it happen all the time. You get a little strict on the rules, where do they go? They want to go stay over there. Because the rules are looser and then until the rules get tied over there and then they want to come back over here. Why? Because they think the rules are looser over here. Well, this is the way childhood is. This is why children have to have parents because we are to train them up like, like, like you would train a vine on a trellis. I know we have some uh, husbandmen here. <laughs> some vine dressers here, right? It may not be fruit. It may be a, a flower or whatever. But you know what you do, right? You got to take that thing. If it's on the ground, is it, gonna, is it good for it to be on the ground? Well, uh, no, because it's not going to grow anything. It's going to try to root itself, and it's going to be a mess, and it's not going to produce what it's supposed to produce. So uh, 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 you, to train it up, you have to pick it up, and you have to put it on something. And then 
when all these wild things start growing out of it, sapping all of its energy and drive and so forth, you've got to prune some of those things off of there so it'll produce. And then you, have to, you, you, you might have to, to move it. You may have to place it on the truck. You, you it just takes effort and attention to train up something so that it'll produce what it's supposed to produce. And Proverbs says, Mom and Dad, uh, your children are like vines laying on the ground out here. And if you don't train them up, there's going to be a real problem. Now, I love these next two verses that he, Paul speaks. Verse 16, I mean, uh, uh, the, the Luke speaks. Verse 16 and 17. This is still talking about John the Baptist. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Do you realize that your children and your grandchildren may be someone who keeps another person out of hell or helps another person go to heaven? Do you know that God intends for our children to win people to the Lord, to be great witnesses and great examples, to be a part of the ministry and the gospel of, of changing people's destinies and lives, that your child is not destined for Harrison County Jail or Parchman Penitentiary, that that is not the purpose, that's not the destiny that God has for your child. The destiny that God has for your child is to help heaven get bigger and plunder hell. And, that, and God says, now parents, that's your job. That's your, you, you, you have to train them in these things because that's not just going to happen. So, because every child has a purpose and every child needs instruction, therefore, every child needs a father. These verses that are quoted in Luke here are, are just verses that are quoted from the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And in the last book of the Old Testament, in the last chapter of that verse of that book, in the last verses of that chapter, the Lord has something to say that is very revolutionary about, about his purpose and about and about life. And, and here it is in verse 5 and 6, Behold, I, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So one of these days, there's coming a great and dreadful day of the Lord. One of these days, there's going to come a time where the Lord steps out of heaven and calls us to glory, and it's going to be a great and dreadful day. It'll be great for us and dreadful for those who don't go. But there's coming a day where the comeuppance of this world will happen in life. And, and in Malachi, God is saying, before that day happens, and many of us sense that we're pretty close to that day, Many of us are sensing, my goodness, this old crazy world is spinning out of control. And, and not just in the United States, but everywhere else in the world. It's ridiculous. It's un, I mean, to, to think that that could continue in that way at the progression speed it's, it, it has been con progressing in the last three or four years, four or five years, uh, is to think, my goodness, I, I don't think the world can survive this. Well, the Bible talks about those kind of days coming. In the last time, perilous times shall come, it says. For men shall be lovers of themselves, proud, haughty, blasphemers, without natural affection. Pretty, pretty, pretty much describes uh, what's going on nowadays to me. So there will be a great and dreadful day of the Lord, and before that happens, verse 6 says, and he will turn, God said, I'm going to send somebody like Elijah. Elijah was a prophet that spoke to the face of the, that spoke to the political part of the, of the Israeli country. He spoke to Ahab and Jezebel, the king and queen. And Elijah said, it ain't going to rain till I say so. And it didn't. And then Jezebel sent out these prophets to challenge him. And you know what happened when the fire fell for God and then he killed 750 prophets of Baal right there. 
And then, Eli, and then, then, then Jezebel said, I'm going to get you. And God sent him away. But, but, but anyway, Elijah was used to speak to the political powers of his day, is what I'm saying to you. So before that, dread, that dreadful day of the Lord comes, I'm going to send somebody like Elijah, and here's what he's going to do. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, which is a wonderful thing, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful if the hearts of our fathers were turned to be concerned of their children, to, be, to, be, to pay attention to their children, to have, to have leadership of their children? That would be a wonderful revival. I, I, I present to you that that would be revival in the land. Because when the heart of a father's turned to a child, a child's heart almost always turns to the heavenly father. So he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and then the children to their fathers. Lest I come, God says, and strike the earth with a curse. Could it be that all of the havoc and lunacy and delusion that we're living in in this world today, could that simply be understood as we're cursed? The craziness of this world that we're living in, the unmitigated evil of the world that we're living in, could it be simply explained that this is the curse? That moms and dads are so busy trying to make a living that they've become careless and distracted. That grandparents are busy trying to live and provide in retirement. And they don't realize that the greatest retirement they have is the next generation. Listen, guys, the only hope for us is the next generation. And have we been so blind that we can't see that? Curse because uh, uh, we're not fathering the hearts of our children. And we're creating weak and passive sons that are afraid of their own shadows, that are being, that are being propagandized at school and everywhere else to believe that their masculinity is what's wrong with this world. And that any aggression, any, 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 any uh, hint of manhood is a threat to our society. And our daughters are being taught to, to fear them and to be afraid of them and, and to know that they are the real problems in this world. Our, our culture has declared war on manhood. There's a term that's used now, toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity? Masculinity, a male being a male, is toxic to this world culture we live in. Toxic means it produces death. That's what toxic means. It means because I act like a man, I'm going to, I'm killing this society. My masculinity is toxic. Is that what we've come to now? Because we're not fathering our sons and our daughters. We send them off to school and camp and everywhere else so that all of the winds of lunacy and evil and corruption and liberalism and everything else takes them and, and teaches them these crazy things because we're not fathering, because we have other things to do. We have better things to do. We, we're distracted. We're, 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 we're living life. We're trying to produce for our families. And, and all the time, Malachi says this, if, if we don't turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, there's going to be a curse on this earth. And I'm just asking you, do you think we're in that curse? The writer of Hebrews has something to say about kids who are not fathered. And, I, I, and I'm going to move on quickly. But I'm going to read four or five verses. This is, now, this is the writer of Hebrews, and he's talking about children who are not fathered. He says, and you have... And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, 
nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there among you whose father doesn't chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. The issue here is, if you are not fathered, then you have a sense of illegitimacy. That if you're not fathered, there is a sense of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, is something wrong with me? Uh, Am I, am, I, am I a real man? I mean, do I understand what I'm supposed to do? Am, am I, can, I, can I be a leader? I mean, uh, is my aggression all right? I mean, what, how, how can I be a man? Well, God says if you're not fathered, you will have a sense of illegitimacy, a sense of insecurity, a sense of aimlessness in life. It's a curse. And I'm just saying it has to be fathered away. Because it's not going away by itself. I'm going to tell you this. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse because this kind of thing cannot be left alone. It has to be defeated. And the reason it's taken such a hold is because it's not been challenged. Well, what would it take to challenge this curse that we're in nowadays as fathers, as men? What would God say to us that we need to do in in this case? Well, let's go back to verse 14 and let's look at the four things that I think are very important for fathers. Okay, you guys ready? I'm just going to go through them pretty quick. We're going to get in verse 14. This is the same passage we read at the start. The Apostle Paul's talking to the church and he's saying, okay, here's what I'm saying to you about what we need to do. Verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. So the first thing that a father, I think one of the, the, the first essentials of fatherhood is protection. What am I supposed to do as a dad? Well, I'm supposed to protect my family. So what does protection mean? I'm, I'm, I, 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 I hover over them, I, I smother them, I, you know, I become, I don't know if you're familiar, some of our older folks, I don't know if you're familiar with the term helicopter mom. Uh, I guess you could be a helicopter dad, too, which just means you just hover so close around everything that you just smother everything because you're some kind of control freak that wants to control everything in everybody's life. Protection does not mean control freak. Protection does not mean that you smother them and you keep their lives under control because the Bible doesn't teach us that we have the right to control anyone else's life. Not even our children. We're to raise them up in the way they should go. And our job is not to smother, but to protect. Protect means if I see you going off the cliff, I'm going to do everything I can to possibly stop you before you go off of that cliff. I've talked with teenagers before who really thought it was fine for their parents to give up on them. I'm serious. I mean, that, hey, I mean, their attitude was this. Uh, Well, pastor... Uh, I'm, I'm uh, 18 years old, and uh, I mean, I'm old enough to go out on my own, and, and my parents don't want me to do this, and I've already told them that, you know, this is something I feel I should do, and so, you know, it's, going, uh, it's all right, so why do they keep on trying to, uh, to stop me? Well, I said, well, let's look at it this way. Let's say you're in the Niagara River, and you're about to go over Niagara Falls. And there's a sign there in the middle of Niagara River that says Redemption Point, which just means if you go beyond that sign, you have gone beyond Redemption Point, which means you're going over the falls whether you want to or not. No turning back once you go past that sign. And let's just say you just went past the sign. Now, do you want your parents to keep trying to get you out? Or do you want them to just sit back and go, oh, well, they went beyond the sign. Okay, that's it. Uh, no, you want them to get them out. I mean, you want them to do everything they possibly, I mean, fighting to the last second, throwing a rope across there saying, hang on, you know. I mean, you want them to do everything you can to stop your downward progress. Well, it's the nature of a teenager to resist 
the best efforts that we put forward because they don't think they need any help. But if you're a teenager listen to this right now, let me just say to you, you do need some help. We all need help. You know why? Because we all have blind spots. We all have spots that we can't see and we need somebody to watch our back and watch those spots and warn us of those things. I mean, it's merciful. It's merciful of a dad to warn a child, get out of that ditch, man. Get, get out. What are you doing in that ditch? Get out of that ditch. Or uh, don't play in the road out there. Or no, you can't go over there, over there and spend a night with them because I don't like, I don't like what goes on at their house. I mean, we all know that, that, that most molestation of kids go on at somebody else's house, right? Now, I'm not talking about the parents may do it, but they got uncle somebody that comes over or cousin, blah, blah, and, 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 and nobody's watching the kid. And some little, That's where most mo- molestation takes place. I mean, we need to warn. We, our job is to protect our family. That's why God gave parents to children. That's why God expects us to be fathers and not friends to our children. They have plenty of friends. What they need, Paul said, they can have 10,000 friends, but they don't have many fathers. God has called us to be a father and set some boundaries in some lives. We, Tanya and I, when our children were growing up, uh, when they got on up 16 years old, 17, something like that, 15, 16, 17, they'd say, uh, when do we need to be home? I don't know why they ever asked that question, but because we, the answer was always the same, 10 o'clock. Now, sometimes it didn't really matter to us, really, but we would say, we'd give them a time whether it mattered or not because they needed to know that's the boundary. 10 o'clock, that's the boundary. You know what happens at 10.01? 10.01, we come and looking for you. So it gave them a little security, I think, to say, okay, I'm out here. If what, something happens to me, at 10.01, mom and daddy are going to be coming to look for me. And they're going to keep on looking until they find me because they don't want me to crash the boundary. Boundaries are necessary for kids to develop properly. I know that they don't like them and they kick against them and they don't want them, but they have to have some boundaries. You can't let them do everything they want to do. You can't let them go everywhere they want to go. You got to say no. I'm convinced some parents have never said no in their entire life. And you need to practice it. I mean, you can say it with any kind of inflection. No. 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 I said no. Ain't happening. I mean, you can use other words. But practice it. Boundaries, Dad. That's what God says we're for. Number two, correction. Let me give you verse 21 of chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in, uh, or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Now, what that means is when he said what he said in 14, 15, 16, and 17, there were still some smart Alex at the church they wanted to act like they were big shots and they weren't afraid of Paul and Paul wasn't telling me what to do, me, 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 because they didn't think Paul was coming there. They thought they could just do that trash talking and nothing would happen and Paul said, oh yeah, I'm coming, buddy. And when I come, you want me to come with a rod? Because if you keep acting like that, that's what I'm coming with. So you got a choice. I can come with a rod or I can come in a gentle, gentle loving spirit, just all left, left, left up to you. And I'm saying in our family, you can have a gentle, loving spirit at times, but sometimes it does take a rod. Sometimes, obviously, you have to enforce the rules. And what message on fathering would be complete without Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24? So there it is. Look at it. See what it says. He who spares his rod hates his son. Oh, my goodness. But he who loves him disciplines him early. And let me just say, I think early means early in life and early in the problem. Uh, The quicker you get the discipline to the problem, the quicker it goes away. The earlier you teach your children how to obey, the better you have it in life. I'm telling you, I've watched parents be tormented to death by their kids because they don't know how to discipline. They let them go on a famous word. Stop that. 
I said, stop it. I'm not telling you again, stop it. I, I told you three times, and this is it. And then they stop because they've learned when they hear, I've told you three times, this is it, that discipline follows that. So how much do you want to be tortured? The first time you say, stop that, and they don't stop that, uh, put the Board of Education to the seat of higher learning early. That means right on them, <laughs> right there early, and no matter how small they are. I know that little, you know, two-year-old or whatever he is, I know that they're so precious and they look so dainty. And I'm so, meh, 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 meh. Do you know that psychiatrists tell us that by the time a child gets nine years old that his personality is set for life? What does that tell you? That tells you if you're going to do something, you better get on it early. I mean, right off the bat, baby. I mean, there ain't no you know, pulling it back. The Bible says if you love your kids, that's what you'll do. If you don't love them, then you'll just let that just go on without any, any resources or punishments whatsoever. And I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement about spanking. Because I'm just going to tell you something about spanking. If you will, if you will be consistent and you will do it right, you won't have to do it as much as you think you will. Because I'm going to just encourage you, all right? When, T when Justin and Amy were growing up, we did not have to spank them over two times a day <laughs> at any time, at any time. So that's just a word to you for, for help. Right. You know what? You know what shapes your character? Pain. Tweet that. Your character is shaped by pain. I'm just going to tell you that. You think about it. Think about what made you change. Uh-huh. Emotional pain, physical pain, social pain, uh, income pain. I mean, pain. Pain is what causes you to shape your character. So there you go. Good or bad. <laughs> yeah. There was a, I shared this with you many years ago, but it's just such a, I, 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 it popped back in my mind. Let me just share it with you. The, there was a, there was a, um, a South African um, game park that started finding baby rhinoceroses. Uh, or is it not rhinoceri? Or rhino? Anyway, some little rhinos. They found the little rhinos uh, dead in the park. They were beat, all beat up looking. And, and they couldn't figure out why, what, what was doing this. They weren't eaten up like a predator had done it. Uh, they were just beat up and battered and smashed and, and left dead there in the park. And so they began to observe and they found out that what was happening is that they had some, um, some young elephants, these little juvenile elephants, and, and, and they were attacking and killing these young rhinos. And so they sent for an expert out of Kenya, and the, and the expert came and she said, these young elephants uh, have no fathers. Uh, there are no bull elephants in the reserve. They took all the bull elephants out. And what's happening is these young male elephants are trying to mate with these female elephants, and they're too young, and it's not time, and so they get rejected. And when they get rejected, they, they take their frustration out on, and anger out on these baby rhinos. And so the game park imported three bull elephants and turned them loose in the park and watched. And when a young elephant would begin to approach a female, when that young elephant got just about to the female, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom! And that little juvenile elephant would go rolling about six rolls out there, get up and run off in the woods, and they never found any more dead rhinos. These adolescent elephants were out of control because there were no fathers to teach them how to act, 
So part of our job, guys, are to correct, put our hands on the shoulder, and ask the dad question. You know what that is, right? Put your hand, put your hand on their shoulder. Here's the dad's question. What are you doing? <laughs> That's the dad question. What are you doing? And it doesn't matter how you ask it. You can put inflection on anything. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You know, say it any way you want to. You went out to eat with somebody that's not your mate? What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You smell like you've been smoking pot. What are you doing? <laughs> I mean, you got to ask the hard question, baby. That's all it is. So protection and correction. And then he says in verse 16, therefore, I urge you imitate me. And I'm just going to, this, this has to do with direction. And, and by direction, I'm just saying, dad, you are an example. Whether you want to be or not, you are an example and your children watch you all the time. They watch what you do. They watch how you do it. They listen to what you say. And I know this is scary. And I know you don't want this job. But you represent God to these kids. I'm serious. And I know this because I've been on many mission trips to places where fatherhood is not even thought about. And one of the very... Uh, difficult jobs missionaries have to convince people to come to Christ in those kind of cultures is they don't know what a father is. So when we say God's our heavenly father, they don't even know what that means. So you represent God to them. And I know you're not perfect and I know you're not, you know, don't claim to be. And I'm not saying you have to be, but I'm just saying to you that, that that's, a, that's a heavy load right there. You're like, a, you're like a, a plate on a printing press. You know, when you, when a printing press starts spitting out stuff, you know, copies, it, it's not the press that, that determines what comes out of it. It's, it. it's what goes on that plate. Yeah, like, like the print in the pictures, what, you, you, you prepare a plate. And then you put that plate in the printing press and then you turn it on and whatever's on that plate just starts, you know, it, 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 it just starts reproducing what's on, that, what's on that plate. And you make copies off of what's on that plate. Now, if that plate is corrupt, if the plate's mis misaligned or you don't have the right information on there, then what's going to be coming out of that, out of that printing press is going to be disorder. As a matter of fact, you know, cancer is basically multiple disorder, you know, just reproducing it. And, and what I'm saying, Dad, is I'm saying this, that I don't want something that is in me that's not right to be reproduced in my children. Because I'm going to tell you, if you have an unkept area in your life, and like I said, I know you're not perfect, and I'm not trying to tell you you have to be perfect, but any area that you leave untended in your life, that, 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 that little weakness area, that little area where you go, mm, I, yeah, I know, I shouldn't do that, but man, or, or anything like that, that's going to be multiplied in your children and, and your grandchildren multiple times. The Apostle Paul is saying here, uh, model me while I model Jesus for you. And the kids are like a sponge, man. They pick up everything you do. They watch you when... When you're talking to mom, they hear your voice. They watch the expressions on your face. They hear the words that come out of your mouth <laughs> so that they can learn how to treat their wife one day. They watch when they're in the car with you driving down the road, they're listening to what comes out of your mouth how you get frustrated, what bothers you, how you handle that frustration in life. They're watching you handle your money and how do you provide for a home and a family and whether you tithe or not. If you don't tithe, they're not going to tithe because they're going to do what you do. You know why? Because they want to be like you. They not only want to know what you know, they want to do what you do so they can be what you are. 
That's what a disciple is. And so they're watching everything. And, and, I, and, and I'm just saying to you, uh, teach them. Teach them how to love their family. Teach them how to discipline their children. Teach them how to balance their finances. Teach them how to get a job. Teach them how to have an excellent life. Your example speaks loudly. As a matter of fact, it probably, your example probably talks so loud that they can't even hear the words that are coming out of your mouth because they're going to do what you do. You know what you're going to do? You're going to reproduce yourself. So a dad protects, a dad corrects, a dad directs, and then the last but certainly not least, affirmation. Dad, you need to affirm your children. Let me show you what Paul did to Timothy here, and this is just a little subtle thing. But notice in verse 17, for this, now he's sending this letter, and Timothy's taking the letter. So when Timothy gets there with the letter, he starts sharing the letter. And so when he gets to verse 17, well, it's not any verses in the original, but, but when he gets to this point, uh, and he's reading, he says, for, and Timothy's reading this, for this reason I have sent Timothy to you. Timothy goes, yeah, yeah. Now, he didn't have to say this next part. He could have just left that out of the letter. That's not really something that the Corinthians need to know so much. Who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord? That was for Timothy. That was so Timothy could understand how his father in the ministry felt about him. He took that opportunity to say, son, I love you and you are doing a great job and I consider you invaluable in this ministry that we have together. Thank you for blessing me in this life, son. So Paul affirms his son in the ministry and, and blesses him and says, you're going to make it. You're doing great. You're wonderful. I don't know what I'd do without you. And this is affirmation. Jesus got affirmation, do you know that? Before he did anything. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is going to be baptized. He goes down to the Jordan River and John sees him and says, uh, he says, I need to be baptized of you. And then John says, no, no, you need to baptize me. And Jesus said, I'm coming and you're going to baptize me. And he gets down in the water. Now he's 30 years old. He hadn't done anything. As far as we know, the, the scriptures are silent about everything to do with Jesus' life except when he was born and when he went to the temple at 12 years old and then he got to be 30 years old. Nothing, nothing, blank. No miracles, no teaching on the mount, no great wonders, no great works, no walking on water, no raising the dead, no casting the demon out. No, he hadn't done a thing yet except be on earth and walk down in that water. And when John put him under that water and brought him up, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came out of heaven and landed on his shoulder right here. And the voice of God said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Before Jesus ever started his earthly ministry, the father from heaven affirmed him and spoke to the value of Jesus before Jesus ever did anything to be, to be credited to in life. So many of us, many of us have a hole in our heart and a hole in our soul because dad never told us that we were acceptable and accepted. He never affirmed that we're going to make it, that we're doing good, or, or I love you in spite of whatever it might have been. It didn't speak at all to the, to the greatness of our life. And so moms can encourage you, and moms do encourage all of us, and thank God for them. They say nice things to us. They say sweet things to us. And they pamper us and pet us probably more than we need to be pampered and petted. But only dad can give a blessing. I don't know why that is. It's just the way God made us. That no matter how sorry our dad is, 
no matter how bad things are, that we still want it. We still strive for it. I mean, I, many times workaholics are workaholics because they're trying to do something good enough for somebody who should have been their dad to say, you're great and you're going to make it. Sometimes class clowns are class clowns because they want everybody to notice them so that they'll say something positive to them because dad never said anything positive. We set our kids up to be vulnerable, but to be attacked by the enemy and to be taken advantage of. Many of our young daughters are attracted to guys that'll say sweet things because dad never said anything nice. And so we push them into the arms of predators and violators and, and control freaks and dysfunctional people because we don't know how to bless the, our lives, our kids' lives. Let me give you the four elements of affirmation. One, two, three, four. Touch is very important. When you affirm them, touch them. When you, when you come up to them and you see them out, you hug them. You notice that? I mean, you, you, you see it, right? Don't just, don't just say, hey, man, how you, you know, or, or just kind of touch your hand. You know, no, no, man, I mean, hug them. Hug them. A 15-second hug creates endorphins out of your brain. That, and endorphins are, give you that sense of well-being and that sense of, uh, of excitement, enthusiasm. Man, I mean, we're, we live in America as a shake hands country, you know, arm's length. Don't get too tight. I'm just saying, buddy, I, I don't care how old they are. When you see somebody, I mean, when you, when you get, greet them, hug them, uh, but touch them. Uh, you, you're going to go in, in, the, in their room and pray with them at night? Don't just go over there by the bed and sit on the bed or kneel down on the floor and say, I'm going to say your prayer with you. Uh, put, your, put your hand on their arm. You know, your touch is a powerful thing. And then secondly, words are necessary. This just, I'm just saying here that you, this can't be understood. It has to be something that's said. You must say it with your mouth, words out of your mouth, not, well, they know. They know. Or you're going to go watch them graduate from high school and you're going to be all puffed up on the inside and barely can hold yourself back from being emotional about it. But you got to be dead and you weren't brought up to be emotional. So you can't, you can't be genuine with them. You can't, be, you can't let that emotion come out and tears trickle down and hug them and say, I'm so proud of you for what you've done. Man, this is such a blessing. You're so smart. You got to say it. I mean, you've heard the old joke where the wife comes crying to the pastor and said, my husband doesn't love me. And he went and talked to the husband and said, your wife says she doesn't love, you don't love her. And uh, why, would you, why would he say that? She said, well, he hadn't told me in 50 years. We've been married 50 years. And the only time he ever said he loved me was at the altar. So he goes back to the man and says, you don't tell her you love her. He said, well, I told her one time. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let her know. That's a funny joke. That's a funny joke, but it's a bad, bad life. Ain't happening. You got to tell them. Approval is the goal. Uh, it means you, it, your blessing has to be unconditional. I mean, it can't be, okay, I love you if you straighten up and fly right. Uh, no, no, no. You, you, you love them anyway. Because you have some kids that are winners, but they're not winners until you tell them they're winners. They don't feel like winners until you say they're winner, Dad. Until you look at them and say, you are so smart. You are so capable. That is so well done. I would have never thought about that. Man, that is great. Whew, what a blessing. You know, uh, anything like that. To let them know. It's like at the umpire's convention. There was an umpire's convention, and they let the oldest umpire, one with the most experience, speak. Here was his speech got up in front of all those other umpires, and he said, in life, some are balls and some are strikes. But they ain't nothing until we call them. You see, kids, some of them are winners. Some of them might be dragging a little bit, but they don't feel like a winner if dad doesn't tell them they're a winner. Number four, 
never stop giving it. You can't ever quit. My son's, how old are you, Just 40? 39? Just is 39. Amy's 37. And they still need it. They still need it. All, you never get too old that the blessing is not necessary for you. You never get too big, too macho. You never get too out there you, to need it. So, Dad, keep on giving it and keep on giving it forever because this is the blessing of the life of the family. Now, I know this is kind of a heavy load for you, but that's why God holds you in such high regard in the Word, because you have a big job and big responsibility. This is your responsibility. And I'm telling you, all you have to do, you don't have to believe me about this, all you have to do is Google crime statistics and fatherlessness, and you will find thousands and thousands of articles with, with reams and reams of statistics that I could stand up here and read all day about the negative effects of fatherless children. And it's our job, Dad. Hey, a curse is coming. We need, we, we, we need, to, we need to avoid the curse. God's given us a way. Be Dad. And some of you dads that don't have any kids around here, look for some of these other ones and you know, help them out because some of them's dads are dead and gone now. And you can help be a father, you can be a mentor, you can, you can be encouraging to somebody else. 